Good afternoon, everyone. This is Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage Collaborative. I want to thank everybody for joining us for the last week in mortgage today. I'm pleased this week to be joined by my friend and fellow Clevelander and uh, president of Nationwide Mortgage Bankers, Jody Hall. Jody, thanks for joining me again. Thank you for having me, Rich. We've been doing this uh, show long enough now where I, we're starting to have the repeats of uh, co-hosts. So uh, you're on the, the, the repeat uh, co-host list. That has to be a good thing. So you might not remember when we did this the first time, my, my first go around, we were talking about FHFA and the 50 basis points increase in interest rates. And we talked about like they have to do something like there's no way that this is going live on September the 1st. Like if we can get November the 1st, we'd be happy. So here we are faced with it all over again as we're putting those uh, fees back into loans um, for FH the FHFA for loans that won't be purchased by December the 1st. Um, and, you know, trying to navigate those waters <laughs> with a, with a crazy year, it has, uh, so much disruption in the mortgage industry, so much disruption really in our living personal and uh, professional lives. It, it's been a crazy year. There's no other way to put it. And we hadn't even planned to talk about this, but I'm just thinking through it now. So my old uh, cap markets hat, like lenders are going to be furiously looking to close refinances and sell them in November, right? I mean, that's going to be madness right before with Thanksgiving and that's going to be craziness. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I think that we probably all have, you know, hedged our bets and we have those fees um, back in, but it is, um, it's the perception of your teams as, you know, as you, of your, of your sales, because it's like, well, what happens, you know, you have that fee, you have the fee in there. What happens if you are able, we are able to sell um, before December the 1st um, and just answering all those questions. And the only way to manage it really is manually. Um, so it just, our, our, our secondary department is going to have to do a lot of checking and rechecking and, it's, it's unfortunate and it's just adding to a very hectic time with historically low interest rates. And again, um, we are the pawns of uh, Calabria's video game. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, he was on the, uh, he spoke it. I didn't see it, but I had talked to a couple people that were on it or saw it. He spoke at MBA's virtual conference, I think yesterday and uh, didn't say too much of anything outside of reiterating uh, his desire to, you know, get the agencies out from under the government thumb. You know, I think yeah. he said he was gonna create some kind of, like anytime they wanna make any changes, some process, which you have to think is already in place, you know, <laughs> already on some less formal level. But uh, yeah, so, but I didn't even think about that. So, I mean, that could imp so if you're a mortgage lender, so I think most lenders either kept the fee in there or put it back in in time where you're not going to get caught holding the bag, which means everybody's going to continue to obviously have crazy bloated pli pipelines as we go into November. Yep. So every refi you can close and sell by the end of November, you're going to make an extra half point on that you otherwise wouldn't. Could that push? I guess that's a dangerous game to play, the prioritizing refis over purchases in your pipeline. Yeah, and I, I mean, we have no plans of, of prioritizing. And, you know, we have been pretty clear, like don't hedge your bets that your, your branch, you know, the branch is gonna get 50 basis points back. Um, you know, uh, so we are, we're just going, you know, business as usual. Um, we feel as though that we're protected with having it in there. And, you know, if it turns out, you know, to the better, then we'll pass that back to the branches. But we just, um, I don't think that you can change. <laughs> I don't know how you prioritize purchase over refis in, or refis over purchases in any environment. Um, so I think that it just is, you know, it's complete, it's, it's too big of a gamble to play and you just continue business as usual and make sure that you're prepared for it. 
That may be the first time I've ever even said the words prioritize refi over purchase <laughs> in 25 years in the industry, just showing what a weird year this is. <laughs> yeah, Great. who would have thought? <laughs> All right, let's get into the news headlines. Um, you know, really a recurring theme on, on this show, the last several episodes has been home values and home prices. Just every single economic indicator that continues to come out, um, no, no big shocking surprise, continues to show that um, home sale prices and home values continue to skyrocket. You kind of have this perfect storm of historically low interest rates, no inventory, and then people like loving like their house right now because there's nothing else to do. So uh, your general thoughts on what's going on right now with prices, values, and you know, what could be some of the impacts of this beyond the crazy volume that you and, and all of our members are uh, lucky to have right now? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting time. And even being, you know, when you work um, for a company and we're primarily focused on purchase business and you're drinking, you know, water from a fire hose of uh, refinances coming in the door, it makes it really difficult to get loan officers to focus on purchase business, which is, you know, what is going to sustain us for the future. Um, and, you know, it it is a game because there isn't inventory, right? So you, it's easier to take the refinance application than um, take a, do a pre-approval for a borrower on a purchase that might not be able to find a home for a significant period of time. So it's trying to get the, um, trying to get your sales teams to realize that our core business is purchase and now's the time to be building the pipeline so that as inventory does become available that your borrowers are set up to, you know, be the first ones to be able to make, make those offers. But I think one of the most interesting things happening with um, sale prices, I mean, the, the, the sellers for the most part are winning today, but the fact that the new home construction is values are increasing and existing inventory is decreasing. Um, I think that that's probably the, where the focus should be um, on being able to, and we're going to talk about builder confidence in a little bit, but I think that that largely you know, plays in, you have to be able to ed educate your borrowers as well. So you have to not only prequal them, but you know, let them know, give them the resources that they need and that um, education of the industry about you know, how long are you willing to stay in the property? It could be, you, know, you may want to buy new construction now, it's gonna cost you more. We have time to regain the cost that it will cost you to get into that. Um, but the existing home sales, you know, educating borrowers that maybe the house just needs a little TLC and there might not be inventory out there, new construction or existing that is pristine and, and pretty, but, you know, there are alternatives through, you know, 203Ks and home styles to be able to purchase a home without having to have, you know, a ton of cash to put into it. So I think that, you know, the more and more people are looking to move out of cities. Um, I think it's going to continue to push the home prices up um, in suburbs. Um, I think that, you know, it's a great opportunity for people who have money to purchase second homes. And I think that that's going to remain strong as long as interest rates do stay down. And it makes more sense today for a borrower to purchase a a home, especially when they can work remote where they can find property. So the um, sellers are sellers are in a great, uh, they are in a great environment today in many parts of the country. Um, but our but our borrowers and are, have a great opportunity as well because of, they can um, homes are much more affordable just because of lower interest rates. So they can, they can put more money into them. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how things play out. You wonder just nationally if, um, you know, there will be, uh, in, in addition to, I agree completely with you, that I think people are kind of moving out of the cities and getting more to the suburbs, that if you'll see more population growth in, you know, lower cost Midwestern cities like Cleveland, 
Cleveland was, I think, like the 10th biggest city in America in like 1970. And now it's like the 850th. Um, so um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, like people that move out to California or the coasts to get tech jobs. In theory, those people can work remotely now easier. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if uh, the long-term impact of the pandemic and um, the work from home movement, if it kind of shifts the population scatter in America a little bit. Yeah, I think that that will. And also, I mean, look at the amount of money that we, if, if you were able to stay employed through COVID, um, your cost of living has gone down. You know, we, <laughs> you're, you're not eating out, at least not in the beginning, you weren't eating out. You may still be, but definitely people's lifestyles have dramatically changed. So I think that people are saving more money because there is, there's not an opportunity to go out and spend. It, your retail shopping is online. Um, so those borrowers are saving more money so that they can afford a higher down payment, which doesn't necessarily mean that they put more money down percentage wise, but that they buy bigger houses. They have the ability to work remote. So where they are isn't as important. And, you know, the, the fastest growing and the higher sales values are in the Northeast and the Midwest, you know, so you, um, it, uh, when, you know, we usually look at the coast, you know, on the co everybody's buying on the coast when um, the economy is uh, great and now the economy um, is down and COVID has hit and interest rates are low and you see people that moving more um, inward into, into those areas. And I think a lot of it has to do just with the quality of life and, you know, the removal of from the hustle and bustle. Um, my family did the same thing. You know, we got bored in COVID. We were um, definitely, we were hunkered down and saving money. So we went and bought a farm in rural Ohio. So I think that more and more will continue to do so. Interesting. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see all the tentacles of what's happened this year and uh, how it just impacts a lot of different things in America. Um, moving on to, uh, you'd have to be living under a rock in the mortgage industry to not have heard just headline after headline of mortgage, big mortgage company going public. Uh, historically in the mortgage industry, very few public companies. Uh, Ellie Mae was a public company that sold, <clears throat> um, but now um, we're seeing it like crazy. Uh, Quicken, um, United Wholesale Mortgage, Caliber, uh, Loan Depot, and Amerihome seem to be next as the CEO of a like medium-sized independent mortgage banking company. How do you look at that landscape? Obviously, those companies are going public and raising money because they want to grow and scale more money, more access to better technology, and in theory, a lot of the things that you know younger home buyers will want in the future. Does that give you any concern? Well, I think that you have to look at everything. I mean, right now, a lot of things give me concern, <laughs> not necessarily uh, large, uh, you know, large mortgage companies going public or even, you know, some of the smaller with Amerihome. And then uh, most recently, uh, the discussion of Guild uh, going public as well. Um, listen, you know, who we want to be as a company is um, we want to be, you know, the, the biggest small mortgage company that we can be. And there are a ton of advantages of being a mid-sized lender that has the agility to move within the market and um, also doesn't have to, you know, report to your shareholders from a control perspective, you know, um, we think that we as, a, as an organization have a lot of great ideas and have a vision for where we want to go as a company. And I can tell you that it would, I don't want to have to wait for a board meeting to have approval to introduce robotic process automation or whatever you know, that may be. So yeah, I do think that there is a significant amount of capital being raised that puts those who are going, you know, who are going public at an advantage. But I also think that 
um, culturally, we there is a shift in mindset and you know who people want to work for um, largely has to do with the culture and you know their ability to communicate with the executives of the company. Um, you know we hear about people just because of COVID not you know wanting to climb the ladder. You know good, bad, or indifferent. I think that that, you know, I think that that plays a big role into people's decision on where they are employed. And so, you know, we'll do what we can do. We'll fight the good fight. But um, I think that, you know, as people, as companies go public, I also think, you know, there is a perception that goes along with that of being a large company. And do you want to work for a large company? Do you want to work with a large company? Do you want to be a transaction or do you want to, you know, as a borrower or even a referral partner, or do you want to feel as though you are a small fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? You know, it's a decision. So I think that there are definitely advantages of continuing for our borrowers and referral partners to work with the midsize um, mortgage companies who have a lot of the resources uh, available um, that some of the big companies do and maybe we do things that are better than some of the bigger companies so i think that it can be an advantage and a disadvantage depending on the perspective um, i i do it's interesting right <laughs> um, and i think you know from i think more concerning um, is the ability for uh, Rocket to, you know, do their TPO channel uh, flawlessly as if, you know, a borrower doing Rocket. I think that that is, that's, you know, concerning. What does that do um, with broker business, which we had really largely seen a shift away from? So um, it's definitely is something to keep, you know, your pulse on. Um, and, you know, the question is, why do some people, why are some people going public? Um, and um, I know that Rocket's philosophy was, is they wanted to give um, more share to their employees so that they could participate in the success of the company by giving them uh, share options. But um, I also think that what your previous culture has been in the way that you have treated people, um, you, it kind of makes you wonder what is real and, you know, what, what is the real reason? Yeah, like, yeah, that's what you say, but is that what you're living? So, um, I, Guild Mortgage, I find as being one of the uh, more interesting just because they aren't, aren't as large as, uh, as large as uh, Quicken or, you know, Loan Depot. Um, and they have a, they have a great story. Um, and they, you know, stand to, they have done several acquisitions through two, from 2007 till now to grow into the company that they were. Um, but definitely, I think that low interest rates are driving this move because no one is going to go public when interest rates are high and you don't have profitability. And, you know, Guild had a 40 some million dollar loss the first half of last year and, you know, came into this year because of potentially because of historically low interest rates. Some of it may have been driven by, you know, advancements in technology and decreasing the cost per loan, but they um, were able to put up almost 111 million in profits the first half of the year. So I think it's largely driven by the environment that we're in and what people's objectives are and, you know, who they want to be for the future. It's going to be interesting. Uh, a lot of new public companies in our industry, their earnings reports are going to be open to the public. It's just something that really, you've had MI companies that have been public, a lot of them. Um, you know, some of the big software technology companies, um, Penny Mac, there's a couple others that have, uh, that have been public, but largely this has been a private company industry outside of the big banks. But uh, uh, one one of many interesting storylines to follow as we move into 2021. Um, another one, you mentioned this earlier, home builder confidence. We talked about the inventory issue. Um, home builder confidence is through the roof. It's at an all time high now, two months in a row. And this is an index um, based on uh, conversations with CEOs of home building 
companies across America. Uh, their confidence is through the roof. Um, that coupled with the lack of inventory uh, in the housing market, uh, doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there's gonna be a lot of homes built in America <laughs> these next couple of years. And all you gotta do is look at these stock, pro all these home builders are public, look at any of their um, stock charts since mid-March when everything bottomed out because of Corona. Uh, the investing community also very bullish on the home building community. What does it mean for a mortgage lender? Um, you know, so uh, maybe just somebody in the audience that, you know, maybe you, they work for an IMB that they're not doing construction lending. Um, you know, I know IMBs have gotten better at that over the years, figuring out creative ways to lend to construction buyers uh, without having deposits to lend out like a bank, more complex. But uh, your thoughts on the soon to be booming home construction market? So um, we're one of we're one of those lenders that does not have a construction department, um, and definitely even having a, a not having a defined rehab department, I think um, puts us at a, a disadvantage. So there's some catch up to be made for um, the lenders that don't have you know construction departments. If you want to capitalize on that business, um, or you partner with you know a investor that you trust um, to and build a relationship with, so that you can originate and they can handle you know non-delegated um, underwriting and you know the the draw process. And it's very difficult to find people. Um, it's difficult to find people <laughs> in the mortgage industry to come work for you in general. But it's even more difficult to find the skill set from the construction perspective. Um, you know, from the home um, home buyer or the home builder confidence, though, um, I think that those the lenders um, who aren't in that business, there's they you have to be prepared to sell around it, right? You have to really look at where your business is. First of all, if you are going to be in the, if you want to, if you have construction uh, lending, your target should be in areas where new construction is the highest. And we talked about a couple of them previously. Um, the highest increase in new builds is in the Northeast. Um, you need to be licensed in those states. It'd probably be a good starting point, um, but also in um, the Midwest and then um, start targeting realtors who sell for those builders or targeting the builders directly. Um, for those of us who aren't, then it's about education and about the things that we talked about previously. Um, my concern right now, like for the, for the immediate when it comes to construction is, where are they getting supply? You know, do they have enough inventory of building supplies so that the building costs aren't astronomical? You know, if a borrower is in the market and thinking that they're going to build a home today, is it more advantageous to wait till the supply chain opens back up because it was largely cut off from COVID? Um, and, you know, provide that education on, you know, how you can, you know, purchase a home like we talked about that, that needs a little bit of TLC with other lending products. So I think it's a matter of, um, a matter of borrower education, how long are you going to stay in the property? Are you going to get the value back? You know, because if your borrowers are, are looking at, you know, they're going to make a move in, in two to three years, the equity isn't going to come back in the market. And um, so they're not going to be able to recoup those high um, supply costs that we see today. Um, we need to educate them on different loans to be able to do um, Mod to do rehab loans for them so that it opens up the inventory that they that they're looking at and they would consider they may not have considered purchasing in the past. And then I also think that you need to look where you're going and whatever it is that you choose, whether you're going after the construction business or or not, you need to be marketing today for what you expect to achieve in Q1 or Q2 um, of next year. Um, if you haven't, if you're just thinking today that you're going to build a construction department um, so that you can start uh, originating loans and have a pipeline of construction loans uh, first quarter of next year, you're, you're quite behind. Um, so 
It's complex. I mean, the, the product is more complex. The interest rate risk component of it is more complex as well. Yeah. And like one of my last projects before taking this job almost six years ago for the bank I worked for was to create a program where we would start selling all our construction loans. So, you know, you got 60 days to close the loan, six, seven, eight months to build it. You don't have a saleable loan for nine or 10 months in most cases. Um, and then there's a lot of re-verifications that you have to do uh, if you're selling to the agencies, if maybe they only last for 90 days or 180 days. So... Um, there's a lot of stuff to figure out there and, um, you know, uh, hedging interest rate risk of a 30 year fixed rate loan at three or three and a quarter percent today that you can't sell until May or June. A lot of moving parts to that. But it's one thing I've seen independent mortgage bankers get better at just in this role these last five years is a lot of them trying to start to figure it out. And one of another uh, many interesting things and storylines as we as we head into next year. We got about three or four minutes left. I got to touch on the uh, election, which is all of a sudden right around the corner. Uh, really no mentions of any housing issues whatsoever. I thought maybe Biden would talk about uh, first time buy, uh, home buyer tax credit. I think it was 08 or 09 um, when Obama first got in office. He did something similar. Um, it, it, it was positive for the industry and positive for first time home buyers. We talked about some of the challenges already, just, you know, lack of inventory, home values going up. If you're that first time home buyer that wants to buy a $150,000 house in Cleveland or a $250,000 house or $300,000 house at a higher uh, value market, the challenge is already there. Um, are you expecting to hear any talk of any housing issues as we get closer to the election? And again, as somebody that runs a mortgage banking company, you know, just like politics aside, what is like your primary, like the, the way the election could make things go one way or another for you from a business perspective? I think that the biggest concern is um, having a having a change, but the in going with a, a Democratic president and a Republican Senate, I think is the biggest concern because um, I think the Senate will, will always be holding back um, money to infuse into the economy, which will help make us, you know, help make us stronger. Um, so without infusing that, I think that um, interest rates will remain low because we'll have a we'll have a, a poor economy. I think that right now um, the Republicans don't want to, in the Senate, don't want to make moves that will lead to Biden. Um, and um, if he becomes president, to lead to his success in the economy. So I feel, I think the unknown is scarier than the reality. Um, I don't, you know, from an interest rate perspective, I don't think that there would be drastic change one way or the other. Um, in actually you look if you have it, it, the rates stay pretty consistent when you look historically from 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, when administration doesn't change hands, the, the rates stay about the same. And actually when you go from a Republican president to a Democratic president, we actually see lower interest rates and how low can they possibly go. So it's likely that our interest rates are not going to be impacted, at least not long term, but I think it's more of what will happen with the economy that will largely drive what happens within the industry. And again, I think the big scary factor is the unknown of what will happen, not what the reality will be. So I don't think that there's going to be any earth shattering changes long term um, effect of of um from politics i do think that if we i don't know if you all remember but if um, we do have uh, if we have a democratic um, senate democratic president our regulation is probably going to be greater so i think that we can anticipate the compliance cost of originating mortgage loans to go up certainly yeah the future of fannie and freddie uh the compliance environment yeah. Really, mortgage lenders, uh, for the first time in a long time, are not, you know, just like hyper focused on making mistakes, 
you know, the CFPB kind of came out recently and clarified that marketing services agreements are legal and not illegal. Right. Um, so the compliance side, the GSE side, certainly, I think it's going to go just one way or the other. Um, all the other issues we mentioned, hard to say because, um, you know, it depends which way the uh, House and Senate break as well. So, but uh, uh yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens, and uh, uh, the I'm sure uh, no shortage of drama will come with the election. <laughs> and, you know, if that's just, just 2020, Rich. <laughs> no I'm shortage. It's total chaos. Like I mean, <laughs> you just given this year and the run up to this election, I mean, you know, anything short of just total madness uh, yeah. will shock me at this point. But. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Our business coach, we have a, a business coach for the company and he keeps saying, you got to be agile. You got to be agile. And it's like, we are <laughs> like, I can't like, how much further can we bend? How much agile can we be? <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. Well, as always, the time flies by for uh, this weekly show. I uh, want to thank all of our attendees uh, for joining us this week. And uh, as always, we'll be distributing the video and the podcast in many different ways uh, to all of you and uh, the rest of our member base. Uh, we will be back here, same place, same time, every Tuesday, 2 p.m. Eastern for the last week in mortgage today. And I uh, want to wrap up. Jody, as always, uh, greatly appreciate your insight. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you for joining me again today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And drinks next Wednesday, right? It's on. All right. All right. Have a good day, everyone. All right. Thanks. Bye. Mm.